All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for IPHA's third Thursday Lunch and Learn web series organized by the IPHA Education Committee. We like to dedicate this time every month to sharing some of the successes and even some of the detours it may have taken to get to those successes, because those can help us grow, too. The point is to connect, learn, and strengthen the voice for public health in Iowa, which, of course, is one of the main focuses of IPHA. If you're a member of IPHA, we thank you for that. If you're not yet a member, we invite you to join us and to help carry out that mission. You can do that on our website at iowapha.org. Today, we're joined by Bethany Snyder, Lori Wachner, and IPHA staff members Lena tucker Reiners and Sharon Miller. They're going to talk with us today about public health workforce development. But before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Your microphone should be muted um, and your camera off during the presentation. Just help us save some bandwidth and make sure everybody can see and hear the presenters. Um, but you can put your questions in the chat or Q&A features and we'll moderate and go through. There'll be time for questions and answers um, throughout and at the end. Um, and if there's time at the end, turn your camera on, unmute, we'll have some time to chat. The uh, session is being recorded and it'll be posted to IPHA's YouTube channel where you can see that in past recordings um, afterwards. But now I'll turn it over to Bethany, Lori, Lena, and Sharon to introduce themselves and get started. Well, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I just have to start off by saying, wow, we, I have three screens of Zoom participants. So I think this is our biggest lunch and learn attendee attendance yet, which um, is very exciting to see such interest in this topic um, and, and interest in kind of where we're taking this. Um, so uh, you, some of you may recall that, um, that, we, that we started doing some workforce development work in the survey a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, and so that's the work that we're continuing now. And we're going to talk about today um, kind of the status of, of, of where we are and where we want to go and how you all can be involved. But before we do that, let's introduce everybody that's on the call. There might be some new, so there's some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm Lena Tucker Reiners. I'm the executive director of Iowa Public Health Association. I'm happy to be partnering on this project with um, Lori Wachner. So I'm going to pitch it to you, Lori, and then you can popcorn it from there. Okay, thanks, Lena, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lori Wachner, and I'm with the Institute for Public Health Practice at the University of Iowa College of Public Health. Um, happy to be here, and as Lena said, we've been working together for quite a while um, and are excited about this work and excited about where this can lead us, but also really need your help and your support for pulling things together and understanding, uh, taking a deeper dive into workforce development. So with that, I'm gonna popcorn it over to Sharon. Good afternoon, I'm Sharon Miller. I am the Director of Programs here at IPHA and I'm excited to see lots of Honey, you're muted. Sharon, I think you muted yourself. Oh, <laughs> Brett muted me trying to admit folks. So hi, that's that's the life of sharing a conference room. So um, I'm Sharon, I'm done talking because Bethany has great stuff to say. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bethany. <laughs> Well, hi everyone, thank you, Sharon. So I am one of probably the new face here. Uh, my name is Bethany Snyder. And I am with, I have a consulting firm called Snyder Strategies, and I am working with IPHA and um, MPHTC and all of you to work on this public health workforce um, development plan and vision for our state. Just a little bit of background about me. Um, I grew up in Iowa. Um, I grew up in Altoona and I went to the Univers University of Iowa, and then I moved away for 22 years. And my family and I just moved back in 2019, right before the pandemic, so we have met, met very few people. Um, so I'm excited to be back in Iowa. I've been doing healthcare policy and public health policy for many years at the federal and state level. Um, and so I'm just really excited to dig into this work with you and learn from all of you. And thank you. Happy to be here. Okay, hey, thanks, Bethany, Lori, and Sharon. And, and I'll explain a little bit of why we're laughing so much. So Brett, Sharon, and I are all at the same table in the same conference room. You can't tell from our backgrounds are a little bit different, but, but we are um, in the same room. So we have to manage the whose mic is on, whose mic is off, all that stuff, um, the, the joy of, of, of shared, shared office space. Um, but again, we're, we're very excited to have everybody here. Thank you. 
Um, and we're especially excited to be working with Bethany. Um, Bethany, as she said, is a fairly new face in Iowa, but um, we've learned so much already from, from Bethany and, and her ideas. And, and we particularly, when, when kind of restarting this work, wanted to bring in somebody who was fairly fresh to work for public, to the public health workforce in Iowa, to bring in that new perspective um, that outsiders look, somebody who has, who does have, um, who has been kind of aligned with public health throughout her career, as Bethany has, but yet can also bring in some new, some new insight and, and fresh perspective. So um, we're just really thrilled with with what's with what we have in the pipeline, I guess. So before we get to that, let me back it up a little bit and talk about what where we've been and how we got here. So, so I think I believe it was in 2018-19. Um, <laughs> IPHA and MPHTC partnered initially to do a workforce survey, um, and it was funded through a grant from the Telgen Community Initiative Foundation. And that work, we had taken, the, if you, those of you who are familiar with PH Wins, it's a study, it's an assessment of the public health workforce done by De Beaumont Foundation. And they put out a report, a regional assessment for our Region 7. And what we realized at that time was that it did not really capture, although it was very good information, it really did not tr capture the true essence of public health in Iowa because the, <clears throat> the, the threshold for being included in their survey, um, size, number one, governmental public health, number two, size of your public health team, and number three, the size of your, the community you serve, really actually excluded most of Iowa. And so Iowa is not adequately reflected in that survey, but because their survey was open source, <clears throat> we knew that we could, we could look at that, look at their questions and redesign that for an Iowa public health survey. So that's what we did. Um, we, held, we conducted that survey. We held focus groups around the state. Many of you participated in, in one or both. Um, and thank you for that. Um, and then we started writing a report and then a pandemic hit. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we still have the data, we still have the report. We discussed it at the Public Health Conference of Iowa um, last year. Um, at the same time, the State Health Department, IDPH, was conducting a, a government, local public health workforce assessment as well, looking at demographic characteristics um, and other things of the, of the workforce. And so, so we took these two surveys, and that was led by Joy Harris and team. And we took these two surveys and started looking at a fairly comprehensive picture of Iowa's public health workforce. Um, and that's what we presented on at, at the conference last year. Um, and what we realized though, again, these were all done pre-pandemic or early pandemic in the case of the IDPH report. And of course the pandemic has changed so much, if not everything. Um, it's, it's definitely touched everything and changed many things about the workforce, um, including our outlook. And, and where we feel we are going or where we need to go. And, and I, I mean, just in the past 48 hours, I've heard many people talk about how right now it feels like a little bit, little bit like limbo. Um, emergency declaration's over, we know COVID's still here. What is our job now? What do we, how do we, do we go back to what we were doing? What were we doing? Just a state of kind of, of um, pandemic zombie, right? Um, and so what we want to know, what we want to be doing is, is at, at the core, our aim is to support the workforce. Our aim is to, to help support and foster the strongest, um, most thriving public health workforce for Iowa that we can have. Um, and what does that mean? What does it look like to have a, a, a robust, resilient, supported, um, forward-thinking public health workforce? Um, we're not quite sure. That's what we're trying to figure out. And that's what we are how we're, that's what we want, why we want to bring all of you into these conversations to help us, to help us map that and see how we all contribute to that shared goal. Um, so we're using the, what the data that we've collected pre and early pandemic, um, looking at the demographics of the workforce, looking at where people's interests are, looking at how students are being trained, looking at how funding models are working, looking at the new IDPH DHS alignment, um, and, and trying to create some shared goals and, and, and paths for workforce development amongst the, the public health community. Um, and so with that easy task in mind, let me turn it over to Bethany. Thank you, Lena. 
So I'm just going to take a few minutes to um, <clears throat> just talk about a little bit what our vision is, um, but knowing that I really see this as an iterative process. So um, we have a general work plan kind of laid out for the next year or so, but that does not mean that there's not a place for you to be involved and for you to share your feedback. So just keep that in mind. And we will share at the end of this um, some opportunities for that and ways for you to provide your input. So um, like Lena said, um, I'm gonna be helping lead this uh, project. And we have a core leadership team that I'm working with. That is the four folks on the um, that are leading this call. So it's Lena, Lori, and Sharon from MPHA. I'm sorry, IPHA and MPHTC. Um, and so we're meeting weekly to, you know, to keep the ball rolling and I say hurting the cats. But then we have a core group that has been involved with this work for many years that helped with the report um, and again, has been working on this um, for many years. And so we are meeting with them monthly and they are gonna help provide oversight, leadership, thought leadership, et cetera, to that. Um, and there are a group of public health prof um, professionals from across the state um, in various capacities. And then um, the first phase of our work will be this spring and summer where um, that core group is gonna spl split out into three focus, I'm calling like three work groups. They're gonna focus on some specific topics that I'll get into um, that will really help us um, come up with what, what, is, what, do, what do we want? We've, I'm calling it a plan. But one of the things we need to figure out is what would be the most useful? Um, is it a plan? Is it, you know, what is that product that we want to share? Um, and what we're hoping is that we can take this product um, and you can take this product and talk to your local electeds, talk to your board of supervisors, talk to the allies in your community and say, for us to have a robust um, well-functioning public health system, this is what it will take. This is what will take in our county, and this is what it will take in the state. And you can use this product to talk to those decision makers and those um, funders, et cetera. But it won't just be like, this is our little piece. This is, it will be like, this is our little piece in the grander scheme of things. So it's a united front of public health to help um, create a sector that is flourishing. Um, so the first few months, we'll be working in small groups. Then towards the end of the summer, early fall, we'll start putting together that product. Again, you'll have opportunity to weigh in on that. And then we're hoping once we have that, by the end of the year, we'll put together some, you know, communications collateral. Perhaps we'll need a PR. I don't like to say PR campaign because people that conjures up things in people's minds, but a way to share this with the public. This is what we need for Iowa to have a great public health system. And this is what we need from you to help it. Um, and that could be a toolkit, resources, trainings, um, PowerPoint presentations, one pagers, et cetera. And then as we um, move into the early next year, hopefully we can leverage the legislative session or other things um, happening to highlight this and use this um, as these discussions are happening in Iowa. So that's kind of the broad vision of the next year is these three main phases of work. Um, so now I'm going to, I'm going to pause for a minute because I feel like I'm just talking at you and see if anyone, um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. We have people monitoring it. Lori did put the link to the report in the chat. So you can take a look. That is kind of our blueprint, um, for this work and how we're orienting our work around it. So, um, with that in mind, the, core group, like I said, is splitting off into three work groups this spring, and it's focused around three topics. And the three topics are, um, I'll first name them and I'll describe each of them after that. So the first one is our visioning group. So what is our vision for public health in Iowa? And as someone who kind of, I see, think sits on the cusp of like public health versus the public, I can see oftentimes it's hard for us to articulate what is public health to the public. And then sometimes I use the analogy like, how would I describe it? When I, how would I describe this to my aunt? How would I describe this to my grandma if I had explained to her what public health was? And sometimes we need to, it's hard for us when we've been in our sector for so long to see the forest through the tree. So, um, and, and so when we say, what is public health system? Most people don't even know what that is. And you guys know this um, on the front lines when you talk to people about it, but how can we make that case for what is the vision of public health in Iowa that, Iowans and lawmakers can easily understand. 
and support. And then the third one is this a strategic skills group. So these are things, what do we need to have in place? The how, the what, and the how. What do we need to have in place to create a robust um, flourishing public health system? And how do we do that? So in a lot of the research that's out there, they talk about like these com core competencies or skills of public health, the public health workforce, the public health worker. But how does that relate to the system itself? And so I've been working with Sharon with this group um, who brings incredible knowledge, obviously being a former public health director, public health director. And she um, communicates often with local public health directors and we'll be getting their input. But some of the things we've heard, which won't be surprising to you is um, they need retirement and succession planning. Um, as we know, there's the grain of the workforce and we're gonna have a retirement wave. How do we make sure that um, local public health leaders are putting in place plans so new people can take that work on and it can continue. Burnout and mental health. This has always been a challenge of public health, but has become even more stark in the last few years. And we've seen the impact of that. Now COVID has hit, um, impacted that. Also workforce climate, organizational change. And this, you know, we see with the HHS alignment, how is that gonna impact and the change in, um, moving from a direct service model more into a population health model and then leadership training for new public health leaders how do we make sure that the new people entering public health want to stay in public health have the skills to succeed and want to stay in iowa so those are just things we brainstorm those are not the end all be all topics but sharon's group will talk more about what are those things that we need to make sure that our public health workforce are equipped with so they can continue to do their jobs and then lastly, the last group is our non-traditional partnerships group. And this really came out clear in the report as well, is that um, you guys know this better than anyone, like there are many influences of public health that may or may not see themselves as public health, as part of the pub public health sector. Um, and not only do we need these groups and organizations to see themselves as part of public health, A, they already might be, but just don't see themselves as part of the sector. We want them to be able to support and be our allies and key stakeholders in this work. And so some of these groups are ones that are obvious that we've always talked about in public health, food security, housing security, poverty, poverty elimination, community behavior health, et cetera. But then some of them, those non-traditional partnerships like business sector, chambers of commerce, um, Bus we know that businesses um, have a great impact on public health in our communities. And not only that, they can definitely have an impact on the environment in which we are operating and working in. So we need to make sure that we are talking to them and they can see themselves as key partners in this work. Um, so that is what the plan looks like over kind of the next year or so. And so we thought it'd be great to use your participation and right now to have some sort of a discussion about these three topics. Um, I'm not sure how you typically do this, if you guys wanna raise your hands using the reactions, if you wanna post in the chat or how you usually manage this kind of discussion, but um, we thought it'd be great to hear from you, maybe questions you have, or if you have any thoughts or ideas. Um, and then we'll talk about some other opportunities you will have to be engaged in this work. Um, Lena, how do you want to kick this off? Well, <laughs> I just say thanks, Bethany, for, all, for the great description. Um, we typically don't have 63 people on a lunch and learn. So mm -hmm. 64, now that James has joined us. Um, <laughs> uh, so typically it's just, you know, people on mic and speak. But I think we mm -hmm. a, a little bit, the, the, a better way to do it today might be to um, to put, to start with the chat. We do have Lori and Sharon are monitoring the chat. Um, and go ahead and put your questions in the chat. If you really want to unmic and um, and speak um, uh, and turn your camera on, why don't you use the raise your hand sign and we'll do that. But we'll just kind of bounce back and forth between the chat and, and people who want to speak on, on mic. Um, so Bethany just put our first kind of kickoff question in there. Um, I, I mentioned that, that we're talking about kind of what is an ideal public health system and infrastructure, you know, really viewing public health as an essential infrastructure item, uh, or not item, but, you know, um, part of, part of our, our essential infrastructure in the state. So what does that look like? How, um, how would you paint the picture of a well-performing public health system to lawmakers, to public health allies in your community? Um, 
what would be different than now? Or what would be different than in the past? Um, and I see Danielle with her hand up. So Danielle, why don't you go ahead and unmic? Okay, um, so I think that something that would be different for us now or with an ideal public health system is that, you know, we would actually be passing all of our policies that, yeah, that kind of focus on that health and all policies. So rather than seeing all of the policies that we're going through and being like, okay, so how can we improve this so that we're not destroying people's health that we were looking at, you know, before we're building, you know, communities. It's like, what's going to be the impact on our water? What's going to be the impact on the climate? You know, are we building in such a way that we are considering, um, um, you know, if, it, if it's flooding and how can we improve some of those things? Or as we're looking at workplace policies, how can we ensure that we are giving staff, you know, flexibility in their day so that they can take sick time if they're sick, so that they can, um, you know, have access to care? Can we have um, equitable access to care? You know, what types of things can we be looking at in terms of food deserts, especially in an ag state like Iowa, we, where we are full of food deserts? I, I, I just think that we need to um, be thinking about how public health really touches everything and how can we be making policies that impact the health of people and not just profits. Yes, you have the choir here, Danielle. <laughs> I was like, okay, I mean, I realize it's like unicorn society and we all want that, but like you asked no, me to paint the picture. <laughs> no, but I, I love it. And I mean, you know, you and I have had these conversations too, like, you know, health health and all policies and health impact assessments and let's, you know, let's do the right things first and, and you know, maximize the benefit, minimize the, the, um, the potential harm. Um, but getting people to shift their thinking in that way um, within within the public health sector and external to it too is is, is a monumental task. Um, but we have examples from um, around the country and around the world where they where they're taking that approach. So there's no reason that we can't um, look at that here as well. Um, so I always appreciate you raising your hand, Danielle. <laughs> um, Becky put in the in the chat if you want to see that um, and. The, Absolutely, we have a bit of a, bru bru a bruised reputation, um, and not just reputation, but but bruised staff. You, bru we're we're bruised folk right now, and we need to heal from that as well as um, our profession at, at large. So I think that's something that we need to consider as well. And and we should have we should have said earlier that we're at kind of a. a a parallel project that we're working on, again, with IPHA in partnership with MPHTC is a is mental health work group, um, public health mental health work group. And even though they're they're separate, they are separate meetings, um, they they definitely dovetail because we can't build a a strong public health infrastructure without first addressing some of this bruising that, that's happened over the last couple of years. And you know, re-educating people on what is public health, and, and doing away with that, you know, the tired phrase that public when public health is working, it's invisible. It, you know, that that may be there may be truth to that, but we deserve to be seen. Um, and so, I like the idea of the public. What is public health campaign? Or what, are, what is public health? And and getting people to understand that public health is more than pandemic. Chris says we need to establish trust at all lo levels, local, state, and federal. Um, absolutely, and and, and equipping people and something easier, either as you know, Chris, easier said than done, and making sure that we equip people with the messages, with the visuals, with the you know, this is public health captions for that. And I should add too, if this is something that, um, not that you don't all have full plates and you aren't all busy enough as it is, but if this is something that you would like to be involved in, um, you know, we welcome participation um, in whatever capacity you can give as well. So you can get in touch with us offline or put something in the chat or um, we can talk more. I think Lena, this is Lori. This this kind of goes along with this conversation of establishing or, or rebuilding trust or, or continue to build trust at all levels, but also building those friends of public health. And we can't do everything ourselves. And 
we, we need to advocate, but we need others to advocate with us and, and for us as well. And that's kind of that idea of bringing in all those sectors so that we can leverage all these resources to bring more support to public health. Right, and especially we want to hear from you all, what are some of those those new and trusted partnerships that this has, that, I mean, the, if we look at the silver lining, the tinfoil lining, whatever you want to say of, of the pandemic, you know, one of them is these new new partnerships and new relationships and, and new trust that has been built. Um, and so we'd love to hear from you, who are some of those partners that um, that you wouldn't have thought of before, but suddenly like they you realize what strength there is in that, in that partnership. Um, Elise is saying we need to establish academic partners, partnerships with schools and universities to increase public health career awareness. Absolutely. And especially STEM. In, in, you know, we, we are doing a lot of STEM promotion. Um, public health is based on data and evidence, and that, that's STEM. So how do we get people to, to see that? Um, but And likewise, those students who have already chosen a public health career path, um, getting them to stay in Iowa and see that the jobs that they want are here in Iowa. Um, some of you have heard me say in the past that we're training public health 3.0 students for public health 2.0 jobs funded by public health 1.0 um, policymakers. And so how do we flip that or, you know, how do we even that out? I just shouldn't say flip it because we don't, <laughs> we want to keep training public health 3.0 students. But how do we, how do we bring those, the, those, you know, the other two elements of that three legged stool up? Um, so that we are looking at a public health 3.0 um, infrastructure, but at the same time, not letting go of the fact that that we have we still have um, direct care needs in our communities and making sure that those are met. Um, we know that there's changes going on um, with the local public health services agreement that is shifting up and, and uprooting a lot of your, your funding for those of you who work in local public health, particularly in the rural areas, that there's some big changes coming ahead for you. And the changes that um, that that are you know that that you may have differing feelings about, right? Um, and 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 taking people more towards population health is a, is a good thing as long as we still meet the needs of the people that need the services that the home health care teams of the, on the public health side uh, or the public the home health care side of public health has been doing. So we need to make sure we um, we don't lose you know, uh, we don't create a gap while we're, while we're promoting population health. Lena, I threw in the chat just that partnerships question since we kind of yeah. segued it and segued yeah. into that. So um, I think I would love to hear about some of the creative partnerships that have been forged during the pandemic that you might've been surprised by or had intent, you know, always knew that was a path you should take, but it just presented itself an opportunity or what have you. I think that, or just interesting partnerships that have met, met the most or been most beneficial. I just love to hear some of those. And Danielle put in the chat about school nurses have been strong partners, but hate to, to overburden them with more now. So that's good thought, Danielle. Go ahead, Danielle. Um, one other thing I thought about is, you know, the businesses that we worked with, <clears throat> we created a lot of good partnerships with businesses as we helped them with their practice of, you know, how to, how to quarantine, how to move forward, you know, trying to be, um, you know, really active in like in their EOPs so that they could, that they could continue to operate, but also giving them guidance when they had positive cases. Um, and I also think too, we all know that a healthy workforce is good for economics um, and it's also good for population health. So I really feel like they, we could be building on those relationships on how we could um, you know, help them in other ways, in other capacities to build a stronger workforce because it's a heck of a lot easier to get stuff done when, you're, when your people are there. And how can we um, find um, things that we can implement either from a, a local perspective or also from like a regional or statewide perspective that will benefit all employees and, and have a healthier workforce. So Danielle, how do you plan to continue to foster those relationships that, that you started 
you know, under the, under, you know, issues of quarantine and things like that, you know, them needing public health assistance and figuring out the, the, the emergency, um, in, in a non-emergency state, what, what are you, what are you thinking about strategies to kind of keep them engaged? So I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm still relatively new here in, in my space here in Johnson County, but thinking about, um, you know, where I was in Washington during the majority of the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of trust there. You know, there was a lot of good relationships built, um, you know, not just during COVID, but, you know, um, we might bring them into like a, a wellness um, organization. You know, we would invite them to our community health needs assessment. We would walk into their, into their business and do their flu shots, you know, so that wasn't their first introduction to us. And I know, you know, we're trying to think about like, how can we, you know, have take public health 3.0 trained students, you know, bring them into a public health 2.0 you know, field and then have public health 1.0 funding. But <clears throat> Sam and I were talking about this today because we have some positions funded by ARPA. It's like some of these public health 2.0 activities get us in the door, help us. I believe somebody said at one point that if you don't have a pathway, you don't have a path, right? I, I remember hearing that in an IPHA board meeting many, many times. And so this helps us build those pathways. You know, it helps us build trust. It helps us ensure that this isn't the first time they've talked to us. It's not a cold call. You know, we're somebody that they trust. And so, you know, if we're coming in and we're helping provide them a service, you know, whether it's doing their TB test for their employees or whatnot, or it's at HEP B or HEP A, it's a good way into the door so that we can start having those bigger conversations about how we can focus on overall wellness and how we can get them to be our partners. And I will just say too, you know, from wearing my other hat, when I sat on city council talking to a developer, you know, when I was talking with him about, you know, you, you want my vote for this investment, you want this, you want this land so that you can build houses, I want five foot sidewalks. I want some of that TIF money to go into child care because that's something that we need that's going to help overall, you know, so I think we can also be having these conversations with our local officials about how can we make sure that as businesses are investing in the communities, they're also or getting investment from the communities that they're also investing back into them. Sorry, I went all kind of over the place there. Yeah, great points. Chris. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, I'm taking a day off, so I have on a stocking cap. Um, I think the thing that, that we need to focus on, too, is somehow marketing our services at the local level. And I think that that would be helpful, um, not only for our own counties that we serve, but for the other counties close to us, our contiguous counties. I mean, I kind of know what Wapolo County does in Washington and Keokuk. But, you know, even in, when our collaborative service areas look so different for different pots of money coming down, I think it would be helpful to kind of capitalize on, on what we currently have locally and how we can better utilize those services. I did put something in the chat about our child care nurse consultants. Um, we have two in Jefferson County, but I will say um, we, we had established relationships with the counties that we serve in our ECI area, but I will say this, during the pandemic, when you have parents that are trying to go to work and you have kids that need daycare, um, the daycare providers needed to know the information on what they should or shouldn't do to keep the other kids safe, to keep their own kids safe if they had children in their own daycare homes. It, it was just a win-win uh, for everyone. I mean, it was a difficult time for everyone, but it was great to see those continued relationships. But, um, and you have to have some of those in place prior. You at least have to have a conversation like Danielle was talking. You can't have a cold call and say, oh, hey, here's this. And just this week, just for an example, one of the daycare uh, folks called about a child that had a high lead level. So again, it's capturing all things public health with one big broad net and it's difficult, but I do think marketing, I'm gonna go back to that. It would be helpful. And we don't have a marketing budget at a local health department, nobody does, but you know, it would be nice. It would be nice. Um, anyway, I just, I just think that would um, 
help a little bit. The one thing I'm going to encourage everyone at the local level, if you don't already do it, please consider being a preceptor for any type of health occupation student or MPH student. You've got to get students into your department and you've got to allow them to see what it's like at a local health department level. It's so much more than what you learn in a book <laughs> or in a classroom. And if we don't nurture those relationships, we're not going to have anybody coming into public health at the local level. They're going to stay up at a big corporate level or leave the state. So we have to nurture those relationships because we were all students once and we still are every day. So thank yes. you. I see lots of class um, for that. Chris And Lexi has her hand up. So I think she has some ideas. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lexi Hawk, and I'm on the Grundy County Board of Health, and I'm also a doctorate in public health student at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And I just wanted to share a couple things that Grundy County Public Health did this past year um, as far as partnerships. So um, community, community health needs assessment time, we actually partnered with the University of Nebraska Medical Center with three MPH students, and I precepted them. And we were able to complete the community health needs assessment and the health improvement plan with the help of three MPH students, all virtually. And it was a fantastic partnership. Um, they also had other programs, um, activities and products that they developed for our, the public health department. And it was fantastic partnership, great learning experience. Um, they were able to su successfully do everything virtually. Um, and it just was a really great partnership. So I would echo um, what you just said about partnering with students and MPH programs. Um, we we're very fortunate to have the students that we had. Um, another partnership would be during the pandemic, um, we formed a pandemic task force. And so once a week we had a meeting, but it was with all of those kind of in healthcare that were at the table that would be involved with pandemic. So our local hospital, a representative from the clinic staff, Board of Supervisors, Board of Health, um, EMS, many other pharmacies. Um, and we had a meeting that was very helpful um, during the pandemic to kind of stay in communication with vaccines and inventory. And that meeting still exists. And um, our local public health has done a great job keeping everybody connected and informed. So um, I'll say our county's small enough that we can do that, that we can have that pandemic planning task force. Um, we also worked with our local hospital to do a vaccine incentive program um, that we were able to reach the 70% in our county. So just highlighting a few partnerships that we've had at our local health department in Grundy County um, that have been very great for us and can continue. Um, and I think we'll just continue building on those too. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. And, and I, just to circle back to the, the students, um, you know, we have three MPH um, universities here in Iowa, um, lots of colleges and other universities that offer um, nursing degrees, uh, health studies degrees, um, physical therapy, you know, all, um, um, all sorts of students out there all looking for those, those um, practical experiences. And I know when, you know, when I talk with students, they are, they're, they really want to get that practical experience. And, and many of them want to stay in Iowa, you know, if they find the right position for themselves. Yeah, we had actually reached out to all the colleges in Iowa as well to try to recruit Iowa students. And a lot of the timelines with their internships just didn't work mm -hmm. out. Um, but, you know, we we're happy to get the students from just our neighbors, you know, to another state and it worked virtually, but yeah, it's a great partnership. Yeah. They're really hungry for the experience too. And think about the undergraduate students as well, because we do have undergraduate students out there that are being trained up and they have wonderful skills and they are just any opportunity out there. They are just really excited to, to chime in, even if it's very short term. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's so exciting about kind of seeing where public health is going. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has shown a light on public health and has shown that um, the importance of public health to many people. And, and we are seeing across the US um, in, increased numbers of students applying for schools of public health, colleges of public health um, for MPH programs and undergraduate. Um, there's been a kind of a blooming of, of public health undergraduate degrees. And my take on that, uh, that is that people are seeing the value of public health training 
um, in other professions. And so um, because public health is an avenue toward, to equity and social justice and prevention and systems change and seeing those critical skills, those strategic skills of public health and how applicable they are across the board. I guess, I don't know if, if I raise my hand or what. <laughs> you got it, Louise. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I think it's a great idea to use undergraduates. And we've been doing that with um, Greg Welk. And I think quite successfully, uh, these folks are preparing to go out. And I'll tell you, the experiences they've had just are so enriching. And I think the public health agencies are also grateful for the kind of support that they're getting. Uh, and I also heard a need for public information, pushing, supporting, letting people know you're there and letting it go over and over and over again so that people finally grasp this is public health. I think that's key. The whole public information area is very important. Third, my concern is with the whole area of equity. If you look at our conferences, when we have our annual conferences, and you, you look at the folks that come, are we really reaching those organizations that are, you know, we're talking about lifting up the people who are in boats that have holes in them. That's the way I describe it. They can't take advantage in many cases of all of the wonderful things that are being done unless they have representation on various boards, school boards, boards of health, and so on, and even our own IPHA. Fourth, the other part is making sure that we have people who are trained who are also from various racial and ethnic groups. And that's something else that's a big, to me, that's a big need. Absolutely, Louise. We'll, um... I mean, it's a, it's a need across our state for sure. I can just speak for IPHA. Um, we're, going, we're doing, um, this is a strategic planning year for us. And so as part of that, we will be using um, some APHA's um, guidance and reassessing our own um, approach to equity and, and such, because you're absolutely right. I mean, um, when we're not intentional, we perhaps unintentionally widen disparities. So we want to be doing that as an opposite. I just want to note that um, I put a, one of our questions about strategic skills in the chat. Um, so feel free to respond to that. And I think lifting up what Luis just said about cu cultural competency is key and definitely something we should be thinking about in that area as well. So thank you. <laughs> so you don't have to scroll back up in the chat. So the strategic skills, the question is, in order to change, to promote systems change and improve health outcomes, what's required of our public health system? Um, what do we need to be paying attention to? What strategic skills are we seeing, uh, or do we need in our public health leaders? I guess I'm curious on what you see as the, maybe it's an easy way to start. What are the biggest roadblocks right now? What are your biggest challenges? Um, when you hear this question, what do you think? I guess what is what's first, what, like, what, what first comes to mind is I'd be curious to hear about that. Can you explain that a little bit further, Bethany? Oh, we don't know what the next part. Um, well, some of the, when, and Sharon, you can talk more about this, you know, I don't wanna speak for you, but um, we were talking about how, what are the things that we need to be paying attention to, to make sure that we can have a robust 
well flourishing public health system. And what are those things that our leaders need? And so we talked about retirement planning, succession planning, paying attention to the mental health um, challenges of our public health workforce, um, et cetera. So some of those things, not necessarily I'd say like those skills that public health leaders need. I think those have been well-defined in the literature and in the research, we see lots of that, but what are those other things that are really the things that are going, that are going, I don't wanna say bring us down, that sounds too dramatic, but um, that we need to be paying attention to so that we can create the system that's flourishing. I'm not sure if I, I feel like I talked in circles, but. How about salaries? <laughs> funding, yes, funding and resources, always at the top of the list. Um, can I just say, I think we need a groundswell. Um, like I, I will say, I feel like, um, as a director, we, I mean, there's so much system, systemic changes that we need to make. And I spend so much of my day fighting minutia, um, you know, trying to, um, combat like the next heinous bill that's in the Iowa legislature, trying to deal with personnel issues. You know, um, it's it's really hard to leave at the end of the day and feel like what we've done all day is sputtling, you know, where you're super busy, but you don't know what you got done because you were just constantly reacting. And I don't know about you all, but I'm sure you're also exhausted. So I, I just keep thinking like, we need a groundswell of, of like public health voices. Oh, James Bechtel is on, great. He'll have so much feedback. Um, but we need a groundswell of voices so that we can, I think, kind of move some of that responsibility away from just those local directors trying to have 99 fights in 99 counties to make, you know, a paradigm shift. Like how do we move that needle? I think, Lena, we talked about this and, and this dates me, I can't remember. I think you were a director, I can't remember if maybe it was Janine, where, you know, it was like, when we were talking about China hip and how like in, in 2015, I think 77 counties had mental health as a priority. And yet you had 77 counties working on mental health independently rather than having us working collaboratively. It's like, how are we moving the needle if we are, you know, kind of just like chasing you know, the circle in, in, um, we're chasing our tail. I feel like we're all trying to, um, make big systemic change, you know, in a silo as much as we try to work together. I just feel like there's not that coordinated collaborative effort to move forward. I agree, Danielle. And, and I, I've often said that, I mean, we're very good about talking about breaking down silos, but we're very comfortable in our own. And I think some of that collaboration too, especially at the local level, you know, there's, you're, you're dealing with, we don't only have 99 um, local public health departments, we have 99 boards of supervisors. And the, you know, the, it's not only convincing the teams to collaborate, but it's convincing the supervisors to collaborate uh, and, and such. And there's, there's some good, very good examples of that. And then I think there's, there's er other areas of work to be, mm -hmm. be done. So we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanna make sure that um, anybody who's kind of sitting on something that, that's been a little nervous to put their hand up gets a chance to do so um, or, or send it in the comment. Um, or, and, and you can always send um, private comments if you'd like to Sharon or myself, Lori or Bethany, because um, we wanted to make sure that this is, we wanna, we wanna hear you mm -hmm. um, and, and make sure that, that this work is responsive. Um, because it does, it does it nobody any good for us to, to build a plan that sits on a shelf. Absolutely. Um, so that's what we want to avoid. Um, and so I, I want to recognize James' comment there, that greater commitment to uh, demonstrating our strategic skills rather than just skills awareness and introductions. And I think that gets kind of back to what Danielle was saying about mm -hmm. spinning our wheels and feeling like, you know, I don't know about all of you, but I so often feel like I know what I'm supposed to do if I had time to do it. Kind of thing. Mm. And, and so what projects do we have? How can we work smarter, not harder necessarily um, to, to put those skills to use in the ways that we know we can? James, you've unmuted. I'm gonna grab it real quick just to fill on this because it connects with what you were just saying um, regarding the comfort of breaking out of silos. Um, and I think 
just acknowledging that it will be, there will be slight levels of discomfort during that transition or doing that and knowing that that, that discomfort will be part of it is the same thing regarding some of those strategic skills or those skills that are going to be necessary for um, realizing a public health 3.0 in Iowa is that, um, and I'll just be like really crude because I, I now can um, um, speak from a little bit outside. Um, um, we might suck at it for a little bit <laughs> and it might not look like very high skilled when we're demonstrating some of those things that we're just learning. And I think figuring out ways to support each other and to encourage each other to be kind of fearless or to, to take those risks and to step into that space of something that we shouldn't be good at because we haven't demonstrated those skills um, is something that, you know, this group and, and the people on this call and usually the individual talking about this can find a way to create space to, to support each other in that skill development and to take that, that step forward. And so um, super excited um, with the direction of the work that's, that's under being under tough care and, and really excited to see where I'll go. But I do think we need to be comfortable with kind of sucking a little bit at some of this public health 3.0 work because, you know, we're well aware of what we need to do. We probably don't have a lot of the time to do it, but we need to know that when we do try to do it, it might not look that good. Thanks. And, and James, I think that might be the subtitle of whatever we put together. Mm. It's like, we're trying not to suck at this. <laughs> but it, re it also reminds me of, of, a, of something I read recently about, you know, we talk about baby steps and we kind of pass off baby steps like, oh, that's only baby steps. But if you think about how a baby learns to walk, the, the coordination, the musculature, the bravery, the vulnerability that, that it takes for a baby and, the, and the, the fall down and get up and do it again and fall down and get up and do it again. Baby steps are amazingly powerful. Um, so I think that's a good, good reminder as well. And Bethany, I cut you off. So I'm going to turn it over to you and I think you're going to close us out. Yeah, I'll close us off. But that also reminds me that I think, and I have to remind myself of this in doing policy work as well, is that being open to hearing what we are doing, not doing well. And that's hard to hear when you're like, I'm trying so hard. I'm doing so hard. Don't you see all the work we're doing? And then we're if we, when we start engaging these non-traditional partners, we're probably going to hear things, but we haven't been doing well and open to that. Cause that's the only way that we can grow and learn and do it better. Um, so James, thanks for that. I think that kind of fits in with that. So this last few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that are going to be coming up over the few next few months for you to share if you want to, um, your thoughts and feelings and ideas about this. So Sharon, if you, Sharon had put, already put her email um, in, okay, Brett has closed it. Sharon already put her email in the chat, but if you could do that again, Sharon, just remind people that um, how to get a hold of Sharon. I will put mine in the chat again when I'm done talking. You can reach out to any of us. I wonder if, would it be okay if everyone who's on that core group, would you guys just use the little reaction thing? Um, button to like put a thumb up or raise your hand or heart or something just so we can get a shout out to you for doing this work. I think that'd be great. And if you see these people, um, you can share your thoughts and feelings with them if um, they be so open to that. So um, so we'll have that way. We'll be at the public health conference in May. We're not sure what that's going to look like that. It'll be depend on where we're at in the process, but we'll definitely have opportunities to get people's feedback and input there. And we may have some sort of other mass way that we do this through a survey or other sort of, um, training or webinar. So I just want you to keep an eye out for that. Obviously IPHA will share that through their communication channels and newsletters and emails. So keep on the lookout for that. And thank you to everyone who is surveyed and do on these work groups and in this core group, it's gonna take a lot of work. And I know you guys are already so busy and doing the people's work, um, but this is just really appreciate it. And I'm like looking forward to working with you. So at the end, I think Brett has a couple, would like to say a few things. All right, yeah, I'll close this out for good. Okay, uh, well, I appreciate the four of you coming and speaking with us today. And thanks to all of you who came and spent your lunch time with us, chatted, um, just listened in, whatever. Um, we appreciate your time. Uh, we hope you can join us again next month on the 17th again. We'll be joined by Abigail Shehak and Ann Abbott, who are going to talk to us about the IPHA social media community of practice. We're always looking for potential topics for future lunch and learns. We welcome your ideas to help showcase your or others' work. We're scheduled through this spring. Uh, we have openings starting with the fall season. Contact us to get on the schedule. Uh, just a reminder, as a nonprofit organization, IPHA relies on membership dues and sustaining donors to support our mission. If you're not already a member, please consider joining IPHA. And students, uh, if you have any here, 
check with the department chair. Some programs have funding to support your membership. Um, if you are a member, we thank you and we appreciate any donation that fits within your budget. You can join and give at iowapha.org. Uh, recordings of all luncheon rooms will be archived on the Iowa Public Health Association YouTube channel. We also find any webinars you may have missed or would like to revisit. Uh, with that, thank you again. We hope to see you all next month. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.